and welcome to Talking Mindlessly. You are in for a treat. You will be hearing mind mental processes. And as we go through this series, we will look at and examine some key cases that have taken place. We will be starting with the Gypsy Rose case, right? And you'll get to hear different schools of thought and how we analyze the behaviors that took place, why certain things may have happened or did not happen, right? And we'll be doing this once a month. So ensure to tune in and tell your friends. First up, we're gonna introduce ourselves, right? I am Chambers and I am a professor of psychology and it'll be my pleasure to allow my other colleagues to now introduce themselves. Okay, I guess I'll go first. I am Dr. Shannon Shea. I am a BCBA, which is a board certified behavior analyst. I am a professor of applied behavior analysis and psychology, and I also have a master's in mental health counseling. Hi, my name is Dr. Robin Shepard. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I have a specialty in forensic psychology and worked extensively with children and adolescents as well. Hi, I'm Dr. Nalini Bachi, and I'm also a professor of psychology in undergraduate and graduate studies. My specialization is in developmental psychology as well as ABA, like my colleague, also within the fields of neuropsychology, applied neuroscience, and attachment research. All right, and for this episode, you might also be treated to the wonderful voice of our colleague Sam. Please <laughs> come introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Samantha Counts, the program director for Cinematic Arts and the nerd that will occasionally come in and tell you guys to stop shuffling or tapping or shuffling <laughs> papers or whatever. <laughs> or just have something like, huh, to say about whatever you're talking about. Because I, I ain't got no idea, except for the fact that Gypsy Rose's baby has the chance to do something absolutely hysterical. <laughs> so let's ride. <laughs> Sam will also talk to us about the cinematic aspect if a documentary or a movie has been made on any of the topics that we're looking at, right? So to get the ball rolling, we're going to look at this particular case with Gypsy Rose. Tell us a little bit more about that. All right, so I will do my best for my fuzzy memory to recreate it. So from what I recall, there is a woman, I don't know what happened to the father, but when Gypsy Rose started having alleged medical problems, right? Her mom, Dee Dee or Dee, Dee Dee. just really built up like this big illusion and got save the children money to go to Disney and have all these vacations for herself. And Gypsy Rose got older, was a teenager, then she was in her 20s, I want to say mid-20s, is that right, Robin? When she... Oh, great question. Planned to off her mom. Anyway, she got an internet boyfriend. Her and internet boyfriend decided that her mother was making up her medical problems because... Allegedly, Gypsy Rose didn't know she didn't actually have these medical issues, I guess, which is weird because she was in her mid-20s, I think. Yeah, she was, I think she was in her late teens, early 20s. Again. Close. I know if I need a wheelchair or not when I'm 20, but... Mm -hmm. before 20, here, no but good. before 25, when your frontal lobes fully developed, so... Still. Her frontal lobes were not fully developed, and I'm we know... her grace. It, all her life, her mom has been telling her that she hasn't been well. And I kind of understand why you might get to a place where you doubt even your own feelings. Or you begin to believe that you are mm -hmm. sick. And we know that that can actually trigger symptoms that mimic being ill. So maybe that's what was happening with her. Plus, she could have been, been for a number of reasons, she could have been either emotionally immature mm -hmm. and or in terms of her cognitive abilities or yeah. thinking abilities. But in addition, you don't fully develop your frontal lobes, which are your judgment and your problem-solving skills, until about age 25. Still, I feel like needing a wheelchair or not, you don't need to be like ultra cognitively developed, but I'm just planting debate seeds for later. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she <laughs> met her internet boyfriend. They plotted to kill mom, to murder her, because Gypsy was like, I can't do that myself. I don't remember if she said it was because she was ill, but they decided she wasn't. It's confusing. I'm sure it was confusing to her. Anyway, boyfriend kills mom. She gets caught. They both go to jail, but she didn't do the actual murdering. So she got out of jail sooner than boyfriend, found a new boyfriend and maybe married him and is now pregnant with a reality show. That's like the short version mm -hmm. of what happened. So some of the longer version, 
this starts really interestingly because I did some, you know, reading and research and looked at a variety of sources. And it begins when Gypsy's an infant. So she's born in 1991, and as a baby, Dee Dee claims that her daughter has sleep apnea. So that's the first one. At eight years old, she says that Gypsy's suffering from leukemia and muscular dystrophy, needs a wheelchair and a feeding tube. She also said that her daughter had seizures, asthma, and hearing and visual impairments. She got her prescribed multiple medications, a breathing machine for when she slept, multiple surgeries, including her eyes and removal of her salivary glands. And then her teeth rot out, so she has all her teeth pulled. And she also keeps shaving her head. Interestingly enough, not only did she get the free trip to Disney, mm -hmm. she claimed that they were Katrina victims. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot. You got yeah. a home, right? And she got yeah, a free home. Was the free house. I thought it was from like a Save the Children thing. No, mm -hmm. she lied That's and right. said they were Katrina victims. That's right. Yeah, there were multiple celebrities that actually funded a lot of their life, their lifestyle. So motivation is really interesting too, whether it's monetary or is it just solely for attention. It's, it's really interesting to look at. And it's interesting because, well, first of all, her mother was lying about her age all the time. Mm -hmm. And I had seen a bunch of these cases, well, I'd seen about five when I was working for the courts, at least alleged cases. And it's very hard to say whether a case is that or not. The only way you could ever really tell is if you had the child away from the parent mm -hmm. and then they start to get better suddenly mm -hmm. and have none of the symptoms, mm -hmm. which, you know, they typically do if it really is that. And there, you know, is no specific psychological profile, which we can talk about later. But one of the things you have to do is look through all of the documents, which I had to do. You'd have to get every document from every medical professional, which is extensive because as what mom did, every time a doctor suspected, she, she, moved, she uh, changed doctors or she moved areas. So I think just putting my listener hat on, that if everyone who listens to us doesn't have a PhD in some kind of psychology, we should explain what diagnoses we're talking about, what Munchausen by True. proxy is, what mm -hmm. types of people typically get diagnosed with that. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think it would give more context to people that may not be as familiar with the diagnoses who are listening. Mm -hmm. So mom is assumed, was she ever formally diagnosed with Munchausen by proxy? No, as a matter of fact, Munchausen by proxy, which is now called factitious disorder mm -hmm. by imposition, is that Another it? person mm -hmm. or something yeah. like that. Yeah, right? Because it's imposed it's on it's another. Yeah. Well, it didn't even exist in the DSM except as a possible diagnosis. It's just basically now a diagnosis. But it didn't exist supposedly in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which we use to diagnose people in the United States. It didn't exist till then. So she did not have that diagnosis. Because what reminded me is when I was in foster care, I saw this a few times too, of you saying that if you remove the kid, they get better. But what people listening may not realize is with Munchausen by proxy, the parent is not pretending their child is sick. They're literally poisoning their child and actively making them physically sick so that they can then get treatment. It's not like it's an all in your head type thing. No. So I just wanted to clarify that point. They'll be giving them actual poison or things that will, they know they're allergic to to make them ill. So that's why they get better when mom's away. It's not like a psychological abuse thing purely. Obviously, yeah, for, a lot for example, in some cases, it's actually quite common for the mother usually to inject the child with insulin. So that would throw the scent off as so as to speak because it would manifest a host of medical problems that would lead them down a path of rigorous testing. Mm -hmm. I wonder why insulin in particular and how do they get their hands on that? Because it's not weird to have in your body. It's poison if there's too much, but it's not mm -hmm. actual poison. So they do like a tox screen, they right. won't find anything. Mm -hmm. And in some cases too, how they do get a hold of the medicine is that they themselves, they're quite adept at doing medical research, which is really interesting. So they have very formative knowledge of the topic. So they're able to manifest the disorder for themselves. They might get access to that insulin and they might use it for sinister purposes. That, that was going to be my question as mm -hmm. somebody who's been kind of tuned into this conversation because if Gypsy Rose was born in 1991, which is, first of all, wild to me, mm -hmm. I didn't even know she was that close. But yeah, so, so she, her and her mom are not unfamiliar with the insulin sort of accessibility crisis, mm -hmm. right, that has been going on for a long time. So it's very interesting that 
clearly she's quite resourceful. Resourceful enough to call themselves Katrina victims and be like, give us a house, mm-hmm. right? And apparently mm-hmm. get away with that. Yeah, yikes. It really puts everything yeah. into perspective. I, I think what, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think one of the things that stood out to me is that you have to have at least an average, average or above intelligence to be able to manipulate the system, to be able to acquire such knowledge, yeah, yeah. to be able to feign it, to be able to malinger in some cases about this. So it's really, as we talk about, like creating a psychological profile mm-hmm. of the individual that might be successful even mm-hmm. with this. It's really interesting to note that. Or an above average, I don't know if obsession is the, is the appropriate mm-hmm. word, but yeah, just the, the amount of time to dedicate mm-hmm. to that mm-hmm. research and to make yourself knowledgeable of all that for the purpose that they have sort of concocted, right? Well, basically, in the ones that I had seen and what I'm reading about, too, the mothers pretty much dedicate themselves to the child, so they Mm -hmm. don't have another job outside of there, and they get their support from the community. I found something which I had never found before. It's very hard to find any research or statistics on this group because it's so hard to diagnose. And and as I said, you can only pretty much tell if it's actually occurring if the child gets better when not with the parent. Mm -hmm. But I found something that was actually published in PubMed in February of 2022. And they looked at over 108 articles that included 81 case studies. And of these, this woman, Dee Dee, fits a lot. Over 91% of the alleged perpetrators were female. Almost, let's see, 23 cases had a perpetrator with a psychiatric diagnosis, which I believe she does have one but had not been diagnosed previously. And when we learn about her more, we'll find out. In more than a third of the cases, there was family conflict or abuse. And in 14 cases, the perpetrators had worked in healthcare. Mm-hmm. And she had, mm-hmm. and she had, that was going to be my question because I'm thinking that she m- might have had some kind of a medical background. Because to be successful at this, some kind of exposure mm-hmm. or knowledge of the medical field yeah. would be beneficial in allowing somebody to carry on such a grift for a protracted period of time mm-hmm. and to have been that successful at it. Mm-hmm. It isn't just about simply having average or higher than average intellect. I couldn't do what she did right right Mm -hmm. and i I think this is an excellent case to bring up if you ever find yourself listeners in a conversation with somebody who is he has a little something to say about people faking situations to acquire social welfare this is the amount of work it actually takes to be (laughs) successful and the amount of issues that it takes to to be successful so i i do want to kind of point that out as if we're saying like we're just we're just slamming on Dee Dee here. We're not slamming on mm-hmm. the system has enough problems as it is, but it, it was Dee Dee that went the extra mile to really mess it up for everybody else. Yeah. Well, in actual yeah. fact, I don't disagree. The most interesting thing to me was that recurrence. So somebody would do this more than once mm-hmm. occurred in more than three quarters of the cases. Mm-hmm. Now, let's talk a little bit about Dee Dee's background. Please. <laughs> Her original last name is is not Blanchard. It yeah. was I believe. Petrus, P-I-T-R-E-S, I don't know. But she and her family did not get along. Again, family conflict, which fits. The family claims she stole from them on multiple occasions as a form of payback for when things didn't go her way. And they accused her of writing bad checks and committing credit card fraud. She also kept changing her name. And later on, she moves a lot with her daughter. But here's the most interesting thing. Her stepmother claims that Dee Dee tried to kill her by putting the weed killer Roundup in her food. And the whole family claims that she murdered her own mother by starving her to death. Wow. All right. Okay. 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 <laughs> so, 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 fire. I agree. How did the, weren't they worried about her having a child? I mean. What can they do? I mean. They can't stop her. If you're going to adopt a child, and that's the thing, then they can hinder you from doing so. so. But if you're so going to give birth to somebody who has been entrenched in the system for a long time. And yeah. has some antisocial traits. Yeah. Some. Some. A few. <laughs> Just a, a couple. Yeah. Maybe, maybe psychopathology. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because it seems like it's a perfect storm oh, then that yeah. the opportunity presents itself, sort of logical progression for her to be able to like, oh, I see. And... This went on for years, and the reason that it did stop, according to the Lifetime documentary, was that she, Gypsy, did realize, wait a second, I can walk. 
and she started to cognitively process this dissonance like we were talking about of wait am i faking it then now or very very confusing and as she starts to go through puberty and, and other things happen for her it opened up a, a doorway for her that eventually led to to this right so it's like a an escalation a progression if you will mm-hmm. over time should say malingering because i know we use that word mm-hmm. that's the psychological term for you pretend you're sick and you're not sick that's what malingering means if we say that's that. a psych term yeah it is that's mm-hmm. what i use for like lollygaggers you malingering yeah. around <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it from the English language, so it it can share. (laughs) But if we use it, that's what we mean when we say that. Mm -hmm. As opposed to factitious disorder where someone thinks they're sick and it actually makes them sick, and they are not faking it and cannot make Mm -hmm. it stop. Mm -hmm. I just felt I needed to jump into that. Yeah, no, good point. It's interesting because we were talking about someone had asked when did this start that she decided to, you know, Mm -hmm. try and break away and maybe think. Well, the first time she does, it's actually in 2011, so that would mean that she was, what, 20? 20? 20. She was 20. She, I don't know how she got there, but she went to a science fiction convention. I don't know how her mother allowed her to go. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> well, to tell you, don't know. Cause, well, because well, if it's a Star Trek convention, that uh-huh. thing's huge. She should not have been able to go there, given the, the scope of it. Even if it's just, oh, in Milwaukee. They're always huge. But if it's just like a... I don't know, like a little pocket anime and sci-fi convention or something, then yeah, she could probably get away with it. Possibly. I, I don't know. Maybe her mother had her there for some specific reason or whatever, but she meets a guy there. And don't she... do it, girl. <laughs> but at the sci-fi convention, don't pull at the sci-fi convention, no. girl. <laughs> so she decides that she's going to, like, you know, run away, and they run away together. And mom tracks her down, smashes her computer, physically restrains her to the bed. Smashes her computer. Do we know if she was active on any forums or something? I believe she was. Mm-hmm. She was. That's how she met the boyfriend. The she the mm-hmm. murdering mom. She met she him on a Christian man. dating site. There we Shut go. Shut up. Right. <laughs> the mom was just trying to, <laughs> have just to maintain the isolation because yeah. she knows that the yeah. more access that Gypsy had to others and to a world outside of just the two of them, the more difficult it would be for her, the mom, for Dee Dee to maintain the lies and control over her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Oh yeah, because if you're, if, if Gypsy Rose, I want to know what fandoms she's in. If she's active in like fandom forums and stuff like that, you, even on this Christian dating site, you're, you're meeting people from literally everywhere that have the same interests and will, because they're so excited, meeting people that are in the, into the same stuff, they're leaking so much information about their personal life. And, the, oh, you know, so there's yeah. a lot of, oh, so you can do that or you can do this or or you say a little bit something about your life. And they're like, what? That yeah. is yeah. not, that shouldn't be. <laughs> yes, yeah. because I'm thinking yeah. when, when Shannon started by saying, boy, it, it's hard for you to wrap your mind around how Gypsy hadn't realized that she wasn't sick, right? But in my mind... If you've been fed this thing your entire life, mm-hmm. right, and you're also not interacting with other children and people your age, for you, this is what normal is. Mm-hmm. You don't even know that there is nothing normal about your life and what your mom is doing or anything is unusual about it, right? So the minute she starts interacting with people, right, who are more in her age group and they're talking about things they're doing and she's probably again disclosing things about her life that's when you know that seed would be planted and would start growing and she's okay no yeah and and even if Dee, Dee allowed her to sorry i'm really into this now uh, <laughs> not, even if Dee, Dee allowed her to you know engage in because you know a, a lot of protective parents will really monitor and censor what the child watches and consumes even if she's watching some kind of sci-fi stuff, some kind of anime stuff, it still reads as fantasy. Right? Mm, it still right. be, reads as like not real life. Question, could that have also impacted her eventual murdering of her mom? I I don't know, unless unless she killed her with the, the key sword from Kingdom Hearts or oh. something. I don't know what. <laughs> no, <laughs> the boyfriend stabbed her. Oh, the boyfriend. It was just yeah. a stabbing. Not stabbing with like a... Just. What is Maybe. It? 
the cheat process from a cognitive perspective. Uh, yeah. Do we know what age she was functioning at? Yeah, but she would have had a massive intellectual disability to okay. be that delayed cognitively. That's five-year-old, six-year-old empathy development, yeah, kind of. Here's the thing. It, it's really difficult to decipher, even when you watch a documentary and you listen to her. In one sense, if you listen to her, she sounds, she makes good cognitive sense. The things that are lining up temporally, in other words, what I think the issue is, like we were talking about developmentally, is how did her identity get formed? Like you mentioned, typically developing individuals develop their identity based on another person's view of themselves. That's right. So you've got to imagine for her, if she's developing her own identity and the image that's been given to her, well, it's it's completely in that, that fantasy land, like we're saying. So the question that I had is how much did she purposefully engage how much intent did she have when she did go along the lines of engaging someone was it for the explicit purposes of achieving or getting the murder to happen or was it that it like you were suggesting it kind of unfolded and it kind of occurred to her i want to know about the behavioral aspect as a behaviorist i would say she probably connected with him to do that and she wouldn't have thought to do anything different so a long time ago, well, 10 years ago, I had a client with borderline personality disorder, and then I spent a year and a half making a treatment package for that, which then I did a lot of conferences and became an expert in it because she was like, I need help with this, and no one helped me, and I was like, I'll try it, and had some success. But personality disorders are not like depression. They're not like anxiety. It's not like you have your baseline, and then something happens, and you're off. Like, you can't function like you used to. All the personality disorders, everyone only knows the like cluster B erratic and dramatic because mm -hmm. it's exciting, but that's where borderline lands and antisocial and histrionic and narcissism also. But yeah, it's it's this odd thing the way it comes together where you're like, you're not able to interact with other people. Your personality is the problem and the way you interact with other humans is what is disordered. Mm -hmm. But it's not a divergence from baseline. It's who you are and it's why they're so hard to treat because it's like very deep, like it's basic, basic stuff. So like in my protocol, we want as basic as like free associations that you learn that things that come from inside of you are valid, right? To mm. reduce a need for attention. So I don't know if that contributes, but I felt like that was kind of important. So, so but maybe you should talk more about what borderline personality disorder yes. is because you're suggesting that what Dee Dee had it? Well, it's, or that that Gypsy, um, because Gypsy. I'm also thinking that Gypsy had a had a, had a disorder. Her mm -hmm. issue in my estimation really has to do with the environment she was brought up in. So how that shaped her personality. I think the BPD would be about that. Ah, but your environment is what shapes your personality and your whole life in my field anyway. That's applied <laughs> behavior analysis. So I get to be a jerk and say my field is the best one, which I think it is because that's what I do. Anyway, of course you do. So borderline personality to sort of go backwards as someone who spent years and years researching this and treating it, there's a lot of overlap between that and the rest of cluster B like antisocial personality disorder, which we, is what you think of when you think of Ted Bundy, right? Like murderers and serial killers or Bernie Madoff would be a good mm -hmm. example. All of that stuff, like they have a lot of traits that overlap with each other. So when we were talking about her mother, I think Robin and I said at the same time, it screams antisocial personality disorder, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But then also some of the stuff that Gypsy did, right? Mm -hmm. She planned this murder, no doubt about it. Whether you say, she dated this guy initially to get him to murder mom. They planned it in cold blood on purpose. There's no debate about that. And that's a very APD, antisocial thing to do. And mm -hmm. again, there's a lot of overlap. So for mom, borderline personality generally develops in an invalidating environment. So when you're a little kid, or if you've ever been around three-year-olds, two or three-year-olds, when they start babbling and they just make noises and eventually they accidentally say data and you're like, oh my God, you're so smart. You said your first word. And that's kind of how it gets shaped up, right? So you learn that if I say waffles, then mom will be like, oh, that means you're hungry. You want waffles? Here's waffles. And they'll give you food. And you'd be like, oh, the thing that I thought was hungry was the correct thing. The word for that is hungry, right? That gets very disrupted in a lot of people with BPD. And they don't know what they're feeling at all at any point in time. So they always need people around to validate what they're feeling and tell them it's right or no, you're feeling something else. And that is this attention function that is endless. They always need attention. Otherwise, they don't know how they feel or what they should do or where they're at at any point in time, which causes a lot of discomfort, as you would imagine, right? So mom strikes me that way. And that's also the disruption of 
knowing how you feel without someone else telling you, yeah, that's right, that is how you're feeling, is it leads also to the emotional dysregulation, right? Because mm-hmm. if I don't know I'm starting to get upset, then suddenly I was fine and now I'm at 100 and there was no in between. I don't know what happened, right? So some of the history you said with the mom is similar to what I see in people with more severe BPD that don't get treatment, that don't get help, and that don't have a good social support community because they are really hard to support before they get treatment. It's a lot. I find that interesting because I've worked with borderline BPD being borderline personality disorder, and I've worked with a number of them. It's not my area of expertise, and but I've had quite a few clients. And I think she also has a number of aspects that don't fit borderline personality disorder. She fits, in my mind, more of a histrionic, where she needs a lot of attention, as you said, but also wants to be the center of attention. And so it wasn't so much that she wanted her daughter to get all this attention. She wanted to get the attention because she was the devoted mother. And she was, you know, always just giving and caring. That's what the father of the child thought. She had told him that the daughter, Gypsy Rose, had a chromosomal issue Mm -hmm. and he believed her and he thought what you know this poor woman and she's just devoting her whole life and and so I mean I don't know that that's completely borderline personality disorder although I'm not going to deny that she may have that the main thing is and I want to stress this because I think people get this wrong all the time antisocial personality disorder does not mean that people don't like to be around others that's asocial antisocial means that people like to be around other people because they like to manipulate them and jerk them around and, you know, harm them in some way, even if it's just their self-esteem or their emotions or those kinds of things. So that's what we're talking. These are people who don't mind breaking the law, actively enjoy doing so, don't fit in with society well, and at the extremes, you know, kill. And most of Cluster B has those overlaps. That's why I was saying she may not have this, but like somewhere in there, and we can't diagnose mm-hmm. her anyway, and my field doesn't even do diagnosis really. But yeah, right. like somewhere in the antisocial, borderline, histrionic right. cloud of symptoms is Absolutely. where I'd say that lands. So when you're asking if that's her personality and what developed, you learn from watching, you learn from what gets reinforced. So I would say when Gypsy was like, oh, I'm in like a terrible situation, when she like realized it and was like starting to understand, I don't think her repertoire, meaning like the behavior she has available to her to go use to do things, included healthy, non-manipulative ways to get mm-hmm. out of situations. So I don't know that she really could have thought of a different way to go about leaving. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean she was right or it was okay, mm-hmm. but I don't know that any other options would have occurred to her. At it, least from my field, that's especially since say. she tried and wasn't successful. Yeah. yeah, I think, and if you listen to her in a documentary, that's exactly the way she suggests it. You know, this had happened to me. I was left without a choice. I I was starting to realize that there was a whole lot of manipulation going on, and that this was wrong. And she was making me sick in some cases, and I wanted out. And she was isolated. Was, yeah, and, yeah, and the isolation, and this was the only thing she could think of doing to get out of it. Do you think that anything that they did? regarding the medical treatments and everything could have impacted her from a brain standpoint? I think so. I think looking at the medical history, I know that there was a history of seizures. We do know that this type of medication can impair neural regulation, synchrony, things of that nature, connections. They won't know what that's synchrony. So synchrony is this concept of like where parts of the brain align with each other. Mm -hmm. For example, we were talking about the prefrontal cortex, which is the last area of the brain to develop the front of the brain, and the limbic system, which is the central aspect of emotional regulation like you were talking about. So it is possible that some of this medication and the developmental aspects and milestones that she must have missed contributed significantly to developmental delays and you know, resulted in some cognitive issues for her in that department. Right. Even if she did not have, a, say, a genetic, like you said, a chromosomal process to that. So it's possible that may have impacted her judgment, it's too. It's possible, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we just do whatever behavior is, like, available to us, right? You don't... And that makes sense. ...think about things that wouldn't occur to you. I just don't think it would ever pop into her mind to not manipulate mom, to not try to scam that's someone because that's was the thought. only thing she knew. That's what she was taught. Yeah. In addition to this, when if we think about it from a developmental perspective briefly, again, right, and when we think about Erickson's stages, right, 
right? And Eric Erickson, right? So we're talking about, let's look at trust versus mistrust. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, which is formed early in our childhood, right? This is where, based on how we are treated by our caregivers, whether they are attentive or how attentive they are to us. So in, when we are hungry, when we are wet, when we fall and we hurt ourselves, when whatever it is, whether the, our caregiver turns up for us, shows up for us consistently or sporadically or not at all, shapes our expectations of people, everybody else, and the world in general, right? And so the experiences that she would have had at that early stage wouldn't have been one that would have allowed a healthy formation and understanding that the world is a safe place and that she can be supported, right, in general. So that, in addition to the fact that she was isolated, because if Didi moved away from her family and her family avoided her, what most people have, even if they're experiencing some kind of dysfunction in their family, right? What most people have is one or two other persons, right? Who they'll have access to mm -hmm. that can offset some of the issues that they are experiencing or who they can speak to or who they are seeing modeling other healthy behaviors and experiences. If she did not get to have those at all, all as you mentioned Shannon that repertoire that she had would have been completely devoid of um, what are options that are open to me right and we're also talking about the development um, of the brain and we see how all of those things would have become compounded and could have led to ended up what ended up happening right so having a boyfriend and now going down this road did the documentary or the information say who initiated the plan was it her plan to begin with what was hers this is hers she this probably was... in her mind this is the only way to escape yeah mm -hmm. because sure. she's i don't know that she really could have thought that listen i i'm 20 now or whatever i can just leave but she did right she, she did try and then her mother said she was younger and you know the authorities, I think it was whatever the child protection team were, mm -hmm. that they came and brought her back and mm -hmm. mom, you know, was beat her and supposedly she starved her at times too, which I think could have impacted mm -hmm. her brain mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she was failed again. So even when she attempted to leave, I guess that is why you can understand her getting to a place where she's the only person who's going to save me is me. Right. And that really intensely, like almost incestuous environment, if it's just her and mom and no one else is allowed in because yes. it might disrupt the delusion, frankly, that mm -hmm. mom was creating. That's why there's so much comorbidity between people who had, what's the new name for Munchausen's? I keep forgetting it. It's factitious, factitious disorder, disorder sorry. imposed on another. Factitious disorder imposed on another is often comorbid, which means that the diagnoses appear together frequently with borderline because that intimacy that you're talking about is often interpreted as a frantic effort to avoid abandonment, which is mm -hmm. the core feature of borderline personality right. disorder. Mm -hmm. Someone can't leave you if they're sick. I agree. And no one mm -hmm. comes into our bubble. It's the bubble, and the bubble is so protected. Yeah. So that's that. what led me a little bit down yeah. that path. No, I, I agree. I think that that's a good point, and it's a, it's a strong support for a diagnosis in that regard. We really can't know because we didn't test right. either of them, but it would make some sense. I also like that Delaney's point about the role that using Gypsy as a means to earn money mm -hmm. without having mm -hmm. to, to work played a role because if Dee Dee had a history of fraudulent behavior, mm -hmm. right, allegedly, I don't know if those things were proven or a family member were just saying, I don't know, but if those are things that she had done more than once in the past to her family members and those are some of the reasons why they cut her off right and then we saw where she used gypsy to manipulate the system to get money and to get mm -hmm. homes and to get this and to get that it means that there's an additional layer where mm -hmm. the child is being abused in the way that she was not just for the attention so that's right. definitely an important part of it but also the monetary aspect of it was also important yeah, the child um, has a function yes right. definitely right. and she couldn't let her go mm -hmm. right because you need to fill the, these two very critical needs for me one the attention that i get through you because everybody's going to feel bad that as a single mother I'm stuck caring mm -hmm. for this child with just endless laundry list of illnesses that, you know, take so much out of me. And then the other hand of it is, right, financially, 
I'm okay because of this child as well. And it wouldn't surprise me if Gypsy and her mother had conversations. Like, Gypsy was like, I'm not sick. I don't want to lie. And mom mm. was like, you have to or we're going to mm-hmm. be homeless. Yeah, she got older. Like, mm-hmm. That would not surprise me. And mm-hmm. it still wouldn't really be Gypsy's fault if we're trying. I don't like assigning fault to anyone, mm-hmm. really. But I could see that happening and see how she wouldn't see another option. She could have realized that the situation was super messed up long before she contacted the guy on the internet. Mm-hmm. But I don't know what she would have had available to her in her own head as what to do about it that was appropriate or mm-hmm. even legal. Yeah. It's interesting, too, because there's something called generational trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in other words, it's basically that, you know, you see problems in one generation and they just keep getting passed down, whether it's domestic violence, substance abuse or things like that. So where does Dee Dee come from? I mean, we don't know anything much, or at least I don't Mm -hmm. yet, about her family of origin, you know, her own parents and extended family. But, you know, either there was something wrong or different with her brain from the time she was born, or something happened to her possibly in the first year as well. Mm -hmm. And then the concern is that even if we don't think that Gypsy will do the same thing to her children Mm -hmm. that her mother did, she still was raised in a very dysfunctional way. So how's that going to impact her parenting and her children? I've thought about that. I'm hoping that because of the spotlight that has been on her, I don't know, I didn't watch any, watch anything, so I'm not sure what her current spouse is like and what his family life is like. So I'm hoping that they'll have some kind of support so that they'll have access to normalcy because that child is definitely needed, I think, because Gypsy doesn't have enough information or experience with what normal or healthy looks like nothing normal because normal varies for everybody, right? Yeah, I don't know what healthy, normal is. right? Normal, yeah, you know, <laughs> right? Just more healthy ways of parenting, right? Healthy and positive ways of parenting. And did she get therapy since she mm-hmm. went, when she was in prison? She got therapy. Yeah, she was talking about being in therapy. Okay, what That's, kind of? Do you know what kind of therapy? No, she didn't allude to what specifically it was. So, I don't really so we don't know if it was group, individual, oh, or CBT. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how much therapy there would need to be before I'd be like, yes, she probably won't accidentally abuse whatever child she raises to some extent, because her repertoire is just so, like, the stuff that should be in the quiver is not in the quiver, and the Mm -hmm. things that are there are, like, not even arrows. I don't know if that analogy made sense, but it's a lot to overcome, because if you go back, pretend she at 16 was like, Mom, I can walk, I don't want to do the wheelchair thing anymore. We must be able to find another way to get groceries, right? If she tried to be like, no, I'm not sick as a kid. Mom would be like kicking her shins under the table at the doctor's mm-hmm. office, mm-hmm. right? If I tell the truth, I get per- punished. But yes. then everyone says I should tell the truth. And mom has probably also told her you're supposed to tell the truth. But then she gets like hit for telling the truth in front of people. She must be yeah. so confused about everything all of the time. There's a different way of seeing it all, right? And this is through the lens of uh, Dr. Martin Seligman, the father and founder of positive psychology, right? And one of the initial sets of studies that he did was on learned helplessness, right? So looking at his studies, the first set that he did with dogs, what he found to be most interesting in the experiments were that when some dogs were shocked repetitively, they gave up, they stayed, and they endured whatever abuse there was, right? But for a small subset of the population, they kept trying to escape. So my point here being, what if she falls in that small category Mm -hmm. that Martin Seligman was referring to, where she was always trying to escape the the, the violence? Mm -hmm. And if it is true that it operates within this paradigm, then her behavior could be related to that learned helplessness. The issue I think that we're all trying to get to is whether how that will manifest in the future right, as, as she sees, because as she progresses through things, because I know that she she was engaged with someone to be married while she was in prison, and I'm not sure if this is, I don't think it's the same individual Sorry, that she's really pregnant right. for now. So is it that she's seeing every time it gets difficult that she, mm. she walks away from the relationship? Right? Well, she tries to. Get or are they jail. leaving? Mm-hmm. Has anybody talked to? Because that, that right. would be interesting. So it's a pattern then, right? I would be curious to hear what people who have been interacting with her have to say about her mm-hmm. personality. Whether the people who she started to date and then stopped dating, is she the one who opted to leave and, and was at a point where 
they experience some challenge or disagreement or is it that the person go yeah this is too much for me this is this can't work right they no don't know. she's having a baby she's doing the whole thing over again that's now just from sex we don't even know that no no if she's like now i'm in my 20s and i'm getting out of jail and how will i be okay out of jail and have people take care of me in her mind so that's you're being thinking, a mother that's how she knows how to do that so, but Dang. well right so I right? can see like, how that is a possibility, but I'm still hopeful. Maybe I'm stupidly hopeful. Oh, she wouldn't know she was doing that. It wouldn't like. So I, I. We also need to look at the fact that she's never been on her own. She's never learned how to be independent. So it makes sense that she's gone from one man to another. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably when she was in prison, it seemed much more free than when she was out mm -hmm. because she actually could make some decisions for herself, and had some choices and. And guess, I mean, think how scary it would have been for her to go from prison mm -hmm. to then go to be on her own. Mm -hmm. I think now, though, she's living with her dad and stepmom. Yeah, so during her jailhouse interview, she she did say that there were interviews with the stepmom, and I'm, I think it's her daughter, the stepmother's daughter, and they were trying, they invited the guy over, and they were trying to see if they could, if he would be a good fit. They were trying to convince her that she should come out of prison a free, single person. Mm -hmm. She can date, mm -hmm. but they were trying to convince her that marriage wouldn't be a good idea right, right off the, the bat. But I don't think that would feel safe to her. I think mm -hmm. the Nothing way she knows how to feel safe. safe. Yeah, good point. Well, safest, right? Nothing's ever actually safe for anybody. But for her, it's probably less stable, but was really to have a baby be a mother. That's how people will come around mm -hmm. and support you, take care of you. I mean, that's what she saw. But she is in a family now. I mean, if she's with her dad and her stepmom, mm -hmm. and she has, if there's another mm -hmm. essentially sister mm -hmm. in there, then that could also help her to maybe work through the issues with thinking she needs a man. Yeah. yeah. True. She would have to experience being okay, being single, and she's never had it. I don't think. Has she? she? Uh, I don't, outside of prison? She, no, she's never lived outside on her own she has no independent mm -hmm. skills mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so well, there's the other option too of she is very much on social media TikTok and all of it Instagram but like when I'm a jerk I don't know that other people thought I was a jerk necessarily I just go home and I was like I was great today I love me <laughs> and there's no feedback you know what I mean then I go do the same jerk thing the next day until I pick up on it but she's like seeing everybody's like evaluation of how she's acting so that actually could change things so is that a good thing or a bad thing because usually we say it's a bad thing mm -hmm. i i think it's it depends on the saturation because yeah. you because you're talking about social media so that could be unless her family has taken active part in making sure that she has a, a healthy amount of access to social media yeah. and she's gonna get i mean we're proof enough waves upon waves oh, yeah. upon mm -hmm. waves of feedback some of which she'll love to hear some of which will be more devastating mm -hmm. to hear mm -hmm. yeah especially on the TikTok with the the skibbities yeah. and the stigmas get out of here i have no, no idea what you just I, said not me it sounded like wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm hoping that she's still in therapy out here outside I hope so, yeah. and that that can, that can be another level of resource to help her with the transition mm -hmm. and with adjusting as an individual to find herself self and to find healthier ways of existing and living, mm -hmm. right? That would be beneficial to us, her baby, and herself, her family, and society yeah, in but, general. But I think reading that also could be on a massive scale. Her first talking to those people on the internet that were like, oh, hey, that's not right. What's going on in your house? Mm. If she's, well, you know, when my kid is older, I'm never going to let them blah. And they might be like, hey, that's not quite right. She might need some extent of this to realize how many erroneous beliefs she has and mm -hmm. to correct them. Mm -hmm. So it's like kind it of... It could be helpful in a weird... Usually I'd say this is like never healthy and right. always bad, but in this one case... It's kind of like a Greek chorus. Like, yeah. Like mm -hmm. you have yeah. these people telling you what's mm -hmm. going on and mm -hmm. kind of giving you feedback. Yeah, right? she's just stream Minecraft on Twitch and then have chat kind of <laughs> chime in. And yet again, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, guys, this is where we're going to leave it for this episode of Talking Mindlessly. Thank you so much for tuning in. On behalf of Sam, Shannon, Robin, Nalini, I am Kay Dean. And please do join us next time and tell a friend.